66 chapters, and like we have 66 books, and there's a lot of coincidences about that. And after a while, you just feel it's God the way He put everything together. And chapter 50 of, of um, Isaiah is about the humiliation of our Savior, and as you work in through the Kingdom Age chapters and you get to chapter 53, you see actually what took place on Calvary. I like to preach a message on the sober-minded Savior, 
the sober-minded Savior. Father, we love you. We thank you for your mercy, your grace. We thank you for uh, the discernment to see what times we're living in and uh, just the obstacles and the problems and different things that come up. Father, we also understand how the devil is in a lot of ways, being supernatural and can deceive. And Father, uh, we need protection uh, from him. Father, that only you can give. We need protection from our own heart because it's desperately wicked. So, Father, we pray that you be with the message this morning, uh, that um, we do everything to please you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> in Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement, whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities have you sold yourself. And for your transgressions is your mother put away. In other words, don't blame God for stuff that you do. And that's all he's trying to point out here. So Isaiah 50 and verse 2, Wherefore then, or wherefore, when I came, was there no man? When I called, was there none to answer? Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold. At my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the river a wilderness. Their fish stinketh, because there is no water, and dieth for thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness, and I make sackcloth their covering. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of learned. We're going to get into Jesus Christ here. It's amazing um, how the Bible works here. That I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. That means he had a beard, for those who didn't know. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Who's that? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's who that is. And our text will be found in verse 7. For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. Set my face like a flint. Hmm. Go to Luke chapter 9. We're going to note the fulfillment of this. You see, his death was not an event which happened. <laughs> he accomplished it himself. Okay? It wasn't like he fell into this event. Okay, all of a sudden this happened, boom, now it's an event. We're not dealing with man. We're dealing with a God-man. He accomplished it himself. In other words, there was no surprises about it. In, in Luke chapter 9, look at verse 27. But I tell you of a truth. There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. What's going on here? Transfiguration Mountain. Remember when they went up there? Took his disciples, well, Peter and John, and went up on a mountaintop. Do you remember that? So it's a prophecy of them seeing how he's going to look future. That's what it's talking about. They come up on the mountain, and now they're going to get a glimpse of who he is. So, Luke 28, 9, 28. And it came to pass about an eight, about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. And his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias. Isn't that neat? I think so. Shows you where they're at. You know, a bunch of time after they, they disappeared, right? Moses died and nobody knows where he buried him. And Elijah, hmm. Went up yonder and, but anyway, so this is what the disciples are seeing. 
And what's amazing here with Moses and Elias, look at verse 31. Who appeared in glory and spake of, the, of his what? Decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. You see that? They talked about his decease and where it would take place. So he laid down his life himself, but not till his hour, what does that mean? The right time had come. Go to John 10, 15. I just want you to see this, so maybe he had some misconceptions every now and then about what took place. It was not an accident, it was planned. When was the plan? Before the foundation of the world. Moses and Elijah came down and they were talking about it, and he didn't go to Jerusalem yet. And the scriptures tell you they talked about his deceased when he was going to die and what was going to take place. So how about that? Is that what I got out of it anyway? Hope you did too. In John chapter 10 and verse 15, the Bible says, As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I laid down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. Thank goodness for that. And they shall hear my voice. And uh, there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Verse 17. Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Verse 18. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down to myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. Everybody got that and read that? Yeah, talking about Jesus. Now understand the seriousness of his job. He does. And he finished what he started for his father. <coughs> See, he did not quit on his mission. And he did not lose his loyalty or self. He was tempted by the tempter, remember. He was betrayed by an apostle and murdered by those he came to save. Yet like a flint, his face was toward Calvary. Toward Calvary. You see, folks, it is not about not quitting secular things that will matter. It is about quitting on God that's supreme. You better keep that in mind. See, you must be loyal or you'll give in to temptation and sell your will to the highest bidder. Now, once again, I stress, it's not about you. you got to teach your kids to be loyal to God and His Word above their personal desires and goals. You are crippling them too much for crutches by developing their wants instead of their needs. Why do you think people hope from, hop from one church to the next? The highest percentage, the highest percentage of those that do they go to where their wants are, to where the wants of their kids are, and where they'll be met. Wants, wants, wants. I mean, if it goes against your wants and desires, you block it out. Therefore, your children will do the same. How will your kids ever get serious about their Christianity when you're not? See, our Savior set his face as a flint towards his death. He has saved you from the second death if you're saved today. See, he saved you to serve him, not yourself. He knew we would have questions. That's why he gave us his word. Yeah. His word is the authority. I mean... His pastors, teachers, and evangelists are gifts to you for your perfecting. I mean, he said this, so you either believe it or you don't, right? I mean, this, this, this whole thing is really happening. It's really happening in your life that he happened to get you saved wherever and, and brought everything together for you and put you in a certain place. Spiritually speaking, he gets you together somewhere so you can grow. It's his business. And he gets you there for specific reasons of growth. And once you realize part of that plan, then you relax. Right? We do it for school. We do it for work. We do it for everything else. You 
better pay attention to what God's doing. That's all a preacher can do. That's all an evangelist can do. That's all a teacher can do. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. You know, it's interesting that before you get saved sometimes, some people, a lot of people, they always think they got to get everything perfect before they can get saved. You know, you give them the, give them the verse, wherefore uh, God commands love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You're trying to show them that he takes you where you are. Right where you are, wherever you're at. He knows where you're at. There's no way you can get better about it. There's no, no way you can stop your smoking, cussing, damning, and drinking, and then you're going to go to church. It's about salvation. It's about knowing that you're lost and on your way to hell, and you need a Savior. Then he saves you where you are, but he don't leave you there. He starts to bring you up. He starts to lead you, you see. But he didn't take you out of the flesh. So whatever flesh you had, then you got now. Man, a fight the suits. Ephesians 4.10. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Who's that? Jesus Christ our Lord. <coughs> Verse 11. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Do you see that? Okay. Look at verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now look what it says. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of who? Men. And what? Cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. That's some heavy duty stuff. I don't know if you really paid attention to that before. Most of our problems is going to and fro on not being settled on doctrine, not being settled on wholesome words, not being settled where we're at. We keep listening for other voices, other things, keep going over here and over there, and we're missing all the practical stuff that God's already given us. We're not complimenting those practical things at all. No, we're too busy doing everything else. And we're disregarding the practical. I mean, goodness, after, after your kids are 18 and they get out of the house, it's their business, it's their will. However they perceive, whatever they got, whatever they do, it's their business. Break your heart, sure will. But the book's the same. The preaching's the same. Really is. If you're preaching the book, it's the same. Different illustrations. But you're coming back to the same points for hundreds of years. Just go look up the sermons. It's practical. The problem is when they break your heart, when they're in your house before you're 18 years old. We think you're going to have them naked out. So you tell me what's more important. Their spiritual life or their physical because I'll tell you what's going to carry them through. What's going to be able to fight their voices? What's going to be able to fight all those different things? Because the battle's in the mind. And making the body look good ain't going to help them. they got to get the inside right first. So take heed to what is preached from this pulpit. God will give you what you need, and you will understand it exactly.
Conviction comes when you understand it exactly. That's when you say, oh my goodness. But Christians know what to do with that. Now it's time for growth, right? Now it's time to say, okay, God, I need your help. I need to be cleaned up. I need this. I need that. God, I need you. Apparently there's more than just my own. Apparently there's something spiritually going on here that I can't see, but it's, it's, it operates in the spiritual world. And I'm connected to it by my spirit, which is, was quickened and made alive. And then where your spirit can talk to my spirit, and we get this thing together, and then we can reason in my mind properly because I'm spirit-filled and led by the word of God. I mean, the whole counsel of God is preached. Warnings are preached. Why are they preached? Hmm. Because preachers will give an account for what they preach. All of them from this pulpit. And pastors have the greatest burden and responsibility. Go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7. The Bible says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith followed, considering the end of their conversation. Go to verse 17 of chapter 13. Bible says, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Why? Why? For they watch for your souls. And I never forget this. As they that must give account. Why? That they may do it with what? Joy. Joy. If you were a teacher and you were teaching, you'd like some good feedback once in a while. You'd like to see that something was getting through, wouldn't you? I mean, you'd be joyed at that if everybody was just duh and didn't do what you said, didn't, didn't correct properly, didn't do whatever they had to do to the best of their ability. It messes you up. It really does. It says, so they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is what? Unprofitable for you. That's a word we all understand. Profits. Unprofitable. So I see three things here. I see watch for your souls and must give an account. And then if they have grief, you can bet it's unprofitable for you. Boy, that's too known, huh? Yeah. It sure is. It sure is. Pretty egotistical, isn't it? Always remember, as they must give account. Whew. What does that mean, preacher? That means that one day I will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And who knows? Maybe it will be separate from just the judgment seat for doing things in the motive. Maybe there will be a judgment for the office. Why? Because it seems to me if you're faithful to the office, you get a crown. That's what it says for me. So he will set me over there. He don't want to hear me whining because of my kids or my wife or because of you. He's not going to, he's not going to, Put up with all that. See, when we're up there, it's going to be just eyeball to eyeball. And he's, he's going to say, there's my book. You were called. What did you and did not preach? Why? I will give an account of that. 
I will give an account of my prayer life. I will give an account of what I give. I will give an account for all sorts of things that you won't have to give an account for. So, sometimes I get a little more passionate about what I preach. Sometimes I get downright mean about what I preach. But listen to the words. The words will not return void. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word. I'm telling you, sanctify them through truth. Thy word is truth. Not direct TV, not internet, right? Not games. That may help you sharpen some of your mind and work your left and right side of your brain really good. Don't do a thing for people. Spiritually with the Holy Ghost. It does it spiritually in another realm. Why? Prince in the power of the air. I know this. Why? Because I have flesh on me. I told people years ago, I am going to have a little phone this big, and you can call me because I will not text. I will not do any of that junk. It's so impersonal. Just, and I have Brother Colson come here. Japan was way ahead of us. He says they have no personality. They have a national identity, period. We Japanese. He says he watched them sitting next to each other, texting themselves on the phone without communication. And, he, you know, all this stuff, you know. About, you know, this is taking over your mind and over the world, and it's an addiction, it's a waste of time, you're not serving the Lord properly, you're not doing this. <sighs> Ten years later, iPhone. Got all the information I want right at the hand. Bing, 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 bing. Come into my house, what do I see? Thank goodness I got her doing quotes and. You know, Sudoku after a while, I mean, how many nines can you get? Anyway, you know, just put something else in there. But everybody, because, you know, even if it's good stuff, right? It's good stuff. But it's just all the time. Rachel, I don't do drugs. What am I going to do? What do you mean you don't do drugs? Your phone's your drug. No, it ain't. Okay. Only answer the phone when it's got to do with your personal family, you know, talking to your family, whatever, business, right? And then the fluff, don't do it. Do not do it. Yeah, but I gotta be aware of aware of what? Everything. Yeah. How do you know this preacher? Man, I'm an addict. I love reading, I love information. Yeah. What does it do? It eats up your time. Now see, as adults, at least, at least you were brought up reading real books. Most of you were. But your kids won't read a book. And there's something to that. Something to the discipline, something to the quietness with no electronics, turning pages. Something about, you know, the kids in homeschool. Remember how they make you all read those little little autobiographies and biographies? Why? Well, it sort of enhances your Christian walk because you know what other Christians did. You know, the missionaries, the martyrs. I mean, you know these things already. The kids growing up today don't know that. Why not? Somebody's not making them do something. What's that? Read the books. Read the books. Yeah, learn about that. How's that? Preachers get up there and talk about William Carey. Who's that? Talk about Booth. Who's that? How about John Bunyan? I mean, Pilgrim's Progress was like it was up there under the Bible in circulation. Christians knew that growing up in Christian homes. What does that do? Later on when they're out, God can use this stuff in their minds. Don't have that stuff down here? Don't have that use up there in their minds. 
the prince and the power of the air. He knows how to work through all those waves. Somebody said to me before, he said, well, I'm only a social drinker. I said, well, for 90 days, don't social drink. Well, I could do that, but I just don't want to. You can't do it. You can't do it, sucker. I'm sorry, I said that. Apologies. Stop playing video games for 90 days. Just stop it. Preacher, that's not very Christian. I know. Because you already know, right? Yeah, I already know. I'm just trying to get you to see that you don't know how powerful the stuff is yet. Why? It's sort of my job. Well, you're not perfect. Your sock, your breath stinks. Your socks don't match. I'm telling you, you're overweight. You got an addiction problem with food. How dare you tell me about my addictions? Heard it all, didn't I? Why, why would you even say that? Because you got hit with a rock. See, you're the dog in the pack, your little Gentile dog. I threw a rock in there and it smacked you. And so you're trying to smack me back. That's all. That's all. That's how that works. The Bible says don't be under the power of any. The Bible says moderation. See, that I'm to preach the whole counsel of God. Whether I'm messed up or not, I get under conviction doing this stuff. I try to stay right with God. I try to all of a sudden put my phone not do that for a while. Why? Because it does have a hold on me. I can't do what I'm supposed to do. See, doing something that's not bad doesn't mean it's right. Talk about our Lord was sober-minded. He was a sober-minded Savior. He had a goal. He had a goal because of his Father. Everything he did was for his Father. And what is he? He's the example to who? To us. For who? So we will follow our Father, capital F. Not the dude in Rome wearing a dress, ain't got no babies, he's called a father, you idiot. Thinks, God, thinks we think he's a magician because he put the world together. Christians should stop thinking like that. No, you ought to get saved. He said in the beginning, he spoke it into existence, magician. How dare you? You devil-inspired person, you to say stuff like that. <clears throat> Church of a billion or something, and you're their, their spiritual father, and you're telling them that God couldn't do that, but you believe in evolution? Now, nah, Christ ain't fooling around. He ain't gonna fool around with you either. You wind up in hell because you don't believe Jesus Christ is your personal savior. You think the church. We're to watch for your souls. We have to give an account of what we preach. The whole counsel of God. If it's heresies, we preach against it. Most of this Bible is about practical living. Most of this Bible is telling you how to live, walk, and talk. Don't want to hit that? Is there something wrong? Hmm. There's something wrong today. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, did not think this was a stroll through the park, a recreational area, a layover in an airport. But he did see it as a battlefield. He did see us as soldiers. He did tell us we were living sacrifices and that to follow Laodicea made him sick. That's what he said. Now, who on earth is not under authority in that Bible? You look at that Bible. Read that Bible. Who's not under authority? The Lord Jesus Christ was under the Father. If you keep listening to all sorts of voices except those that God put you under, you will dance to a different piper, have more doubt, and reap the whirlwind of despair and corruption. See, hard preaching can save us from a multitude of woe if we take heed to it. We must get our mind, our money, and mannerisms under God before we displease him and take his glory out of our life. Ask God 
yourself for a breath of fresh air, for peace, and the power to do right. Or ask them to be saved and quit playing church. Set your face as a flint towards glory and take your kids with you. Stop playing the worldly game of carnival pleasures and get in the battle. Let's all stand.